Fair swing. We used to hear that in Little League, but you know, we've always enjoyed the national pastime. No matter what condition the country's in, baseball always has a fan and always has an audience. Hi, this is Norm Allen with you on another version of the Out of the Norm show, and I'm in a very unique place today. We're going to find out how these great traditional wooden baseball bats are made from a new or a great company called D Bat located here in Mount Pleasant, Texas, and there's a whole big story. Mr. Lance Martin's going to join us in a few minutes and uh, Give us a tour, show us how it's done, and we might hear a little batter up. I hope so. Stick around on the Out of the Norm Show, because there's good stuff coming where the story's all about you. The Out of the Norm Show is brought to you through the generosity of our partners in progress. Northwest Arkansas Community College, the College at the Crossing, Bella Vista Center, NV Salon, specializing in cuts and color in Fayetteville, A.G. Russell Knives in Rogers, the Bank of Gravit, caretakers of the Arkansas spirit. The Tuscan Trotter American Brasserie, just off the square in downtown Bentonville. Discount Smokes and Liquors at the State Line in Jane, Missouri. Hoffman Realty in Bella Vista. It's the Out of the Norm Show. Stories about people, places, things, and events from all across the great country of America. The Out of the Norm Show, where the stories are all about you. Hi, welcome back to the Out of the Norm Show. I want to introduce you to a guy who is a baseball fanatic. Would you call yourself a fanatic? Uh, yes, sir. Love, love the game. Do you? That's in my heart. So all, all of you, since you were a little kid? Since I was a young kid, I was even a bat boy for a, a guy who took a group of young kids from West Texas all the way to Kingston, North Carolina. So, yes, sir. Wow. Wow. This is Lance Martin. He's the National Promotion and Sales Director for D-Bat. Now, that's an interesting name. I just happened to have been driving by the place to, uh, a few days ago, and I saw your sign. I thought, well, how interesting is that? And I thought it would be a story you'd be interested in. And come to find out, this is kind of the equivalent of the tech this brand of like Louisville Slugger, aren't you? Definitely. Yes, sir. We started in 2001, and you can figure out that DBAT is an acronym, and it represents Dallas Baseball Academy of Texas, and those started in 1998. Now, what, what is a, a baseball academy? Uh, they're indoor, outdoor hitting facilities. It's a great place for young kids to go out off the streets and into something and actually participate, whether it's hot or cold out. They all have AC or heater, heaters. Uh, they're uniform. Uh, they're very, very well lit. Uh, just lots of players go to those things. We have about 16 locations right now. So these are like training facilities? Do they do coaching there and everything, or they, are they just hitting like batting cages? No, sir. Your, your local ball players will be actual instructors, so that also creates a job, which, oh, you know, jobs yeah. are kind of scarce these days. But, right. you know, the old baseball player who isn't really doing much right now but still has a lot of knowledge, he's able to come in and kind of help out with the young kids who want to go to where he was, and hopefully they can go a step or two further. So now, what age group usually uses these facilities? Uh, we started when we were about six, six years old to at least 18, and then we also have the men's senior league who will come in and also take a... Uh, so there's a whole there. league of, of just hitters? Because they're not really playing the game, right? Uh, there, there's fielding opportunities in there. Then when some of them have the live clay mounds, and then there's mm -hmm. also that have the, the wood mounds. So there's pitching also going in there. And then you can move some of the nets back out of the way, and you'll see that there's fielding that you can also field at those things. So a whole team environment can go to the academies. And then Three years after we started the academy, we were like, well, we want to build our own bat, and this is where we're at right now. And ten years into the bat-making process, we're uh, already competing with Rawlings and Louisville for Marketplace uh, right. in, in the MLBs of all places. Now, these are not polymer or, or, or aluminum bats or anything like that, are they? No, sir. These are uh, stri strictly wood, ash, birch, and maple. Maple was introduced in 1992 to the, wood, to the game of baseball. Mm -hmm. Ash has been around since Babe Ruth, Hannes Wagner, Ted Williams, Splinter Splinter. Even Josh Hamilton will still use ash. And it's got a little bit different crack than what your maple does. The maple has more pop. Right. But the thing about maple is it was introduced in 1992, and it has a hairline grain. Anytime you hit, put some force behind a hairline grain and you, you do that, goes into two pieces, and that's the controversy you see on TVs these days. Oh, with because, bats breaking? Yes, sir. The maple bat will go into two pieces always, where ash will always splinter up and go into one piece break. 
Oh, but it, so that's a real part of the controversy, though, you say? Yes, sir. In 1992, Sam Holman, who owns Sam Bats, he did bring the, the, the wood of maple into the game of baseball, and they did not do enough research to figure out why the two were breaking. Yeah, it has a lot more pop and a little more trampoline effect. Your ball will go further, but at the same time, it's a little more dangerous for the players. Mm. So why have they, why has Major League and college ball, well, college ball uses aluminum bats, don't they? Yeah, uh, a few of them. The there part. is one up there in New York, the Staten Island League. Uh, they're all Division One, and they're they're they only use wood, and it's kind of like a uh, a focus group, you'd say. And it looks like the state of New Mexico and California are going to follow suit with going all go back wood. to wood. Yes, sir. Go back Strictly to wood. wood. Well, that's a good thing for businesses, though, isn't it? Uh, for our business, it is a good thing, <laughs> yeah. um, and also where we get the wood from, so the wood people will be, you know, extremely happy. And again, it does take thirty to. 45 years to get one of our bats made, so that's one thing we have to look at. We need to grow the farms now and start preparing for that kind of market. Now. So you're not importing woods from anywhere overseas then, are you? No, sir. It strictly comes out of the northeast part of the United States and a little bit in the Canada area, but it all originates from the northeast part of the U.S. All American-made bats. That's why we hear that nice crack in the ballpark and it echoes off the stands. I just love it. Oh, it's uh, soothing to your ears to hear a baseball go off a piece of wood. That's, uh, that's where the the game of baseball started as some of your some of your viewers should know like 1960 below there was no metal bats so we do love going back to where we started sure makes the ball travel and sound good well we're going to find out how these bats are made aren't we yes sir i'll take it through we're going to start from the very beginning a big old chunk of wood all the way through to getting ready to swing one over home plate that's a fact and right. one thing i want to tell your audience here right quick we do work with our hearts and we learn with our minds around here but if you're working with your heart no one can beat you out there in the marketplace because you're putting out the number one product you're right all right well this is going to be fun hey we're not going to take a break we're just going to take a walk so come on go with <laughs> us we're going to go back in the factory and find out where that crack comes from all right go back with me a little bit here audience you got to go back to 1842 to find out the first baseball game was played in hoboken new jersey and this was uh the first game ever recorded here in the united states of america and at that time they had no 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 limitations on their bat sizes you could use a bat as big as you wanted however in 1859 they did decide hey your bats are way too big and whenever they had a big bat it would create for it like what you call a sweeping method with your swing you wonder why they had a big old sweeping method. Well, this is why, because their bats are so long. But in 1859, they decided to put down a law. The MLB governing body said you could build a bat up to 42 inches in length. And present day, this law is still in effect here in 2011. If I wanted to build a bat up to 42 inches in length, MLB says I can. However, Babe Ruth was probably the only one to swing one that was near this size and weight, but his was only 36 inches in length. Three woods we were talking about earlier in the piece, uh, maple, birch, and ash. Uh, each of them have their own unique qualities, except the two, maple and birch, are almost alike, except one is a little bit different texture than the other. The birch here has what we call the hairline grain. As you can see, it's a real thin line grain, a lot like the maple. The only difference is the texture here is it feels like a peach versus the smoothness of an apple over here on the, the maple. But maple was introduced into the game of baseball in 1992. Again, let's look at that hairline grain that you see in there. If I were to put any force behind one piece of hair here, I'm going to be able to rip it into two pieces every single time. And with this coming into the game of baseball in 1992, no one knew what the repercussions would be whenever they did introduce this into the game. However, let's look at this ash right quick. Ash is a super wide grain material. And as you can tell, Bill Nye, the science guy, I've been here for six years. He's came here three times in the six years I've been here. We looked at the grain. I knew the brown was called the grain. You can really see it. That's about five or six hair fibers together. And the white is what we call ligdin. It's like a ligament in your muscle. Whenever I get on one knee, what holds my, my, my muscles in place? They're ligaments. And that's what holds these grains in place, but they're called ligdins. So whenever this bat goes to break, that ligdin wants to separate that big old fiber of hair but it can't so it comes back down and does the one piece break and that's the beauty of ash and if you can hit a baseball with ash then you can hit it with any kind of piece of wood now the maple is similar to the the metal bat that it has a little bit of a, a pop off of it this is what we call the trampoline effect 
But again, I cannot stress the importance of the hairline grain in here. And there's several hairline grains in there, but however, the lignin cannot do its job correctly because the grains are too thin and they always break into two pieces. But this is a maple billet, a 37 inches round, and this is where we do the start of the bat making process. If you can imagine swinging a piece of lumber this size, well, guess what? We're going to help you out a little bit and cut it down so we don't have to go up there with all of our muscles. We can actually use our hands and our hips to swing it. So let's go see how this is done. Bill it to a bat. All the hard work starts right here. We love the people up in the northeast part of the United States. They send us down our products that we need to make our end final product, or the materials to make our final product. This here is a piece of ash. Each one of our billets are weighed and inspected in order to get the premier, um, in order to get what the customer wants there at the end of the, the end of the bath there. So each bat here is precis uh, precisely weighed and inspected. The reason we do the weights is because whenever we have our weights over here on our, uh, when we have our billets separated out here, it's easier to find your tear weight. You're looking at tear weights coming off your next machine and that's going before it's sanded. And that's going to be your raw material, but you got to know what billet to put in there in order to get your tear weight accurate. And what we're going to do here is just get our heavy weights in here. As you can see, most billets are uh, just, just put down and um, each of them are weighed to way to meet, meet, the, meet the expectations of the hitters. As you can see, we've weighed and inspected most of these billets down here. Each of them have a number, and I know that when they're put on the shelf that my guys have looked at them and they're not crooked and they're straight. Uh, the number represents the weight, of, weight, the weight of the billet, and this enables us to go over here to the shelf, grab whatever billet we need in order to run for the next, next position down there, and this will allow us to, to come up with our tear weight. Um, if you don't get this done the first time the right way, then you have to guess to where your weights are, and that's not the way you want to run business. You want to know exactly where you're at throughout the whole process, and weighing our billets is one key to getting us to where we know where we're going. Okay, I've got my cart full of billets here, and we're going to go to the machine that's going to do the rest of the finish work for us here. This is going to allow us to cut down to a ten thousandth of an inch every single time. You definitely want to get the right side in there for, for your customer. That way you get your handle and your grain straight. Alright, now then, what you're going to see here, we're going to go ahead and pull up our files, and I can run one billet for one bat every single time down to ten thousandth of an inch here. Let's go to our automatic and what you're going to see here is the file load up. As you see our billets cut, I know my file is good there and now we're going to see it happen right here on the platform at the same time. I'm going to come to the other side but what you're going to see is 2500 revolutions per minute. And the same time it's happening on the platform, it's happening right here on the screen as well. So we're getting monitor of what we're, what, what's occurring throughout the process. What we're looking for here is tear weight. As you can see, I've got my handle cut off right through here, and you're fixing to see it on your screen. But what's happening down there is the billet is being cut with the two knives. You have a lead knife and a follow knife. The lead knife takes off most of it, the follow knife cleans it up. As you can see, the handle's running about 2,500 revolutions per minute. And the best thing about this bat making process right here is coming up. You get second to none compression due to the this is what we call a steady rest. This holds our bat right in place so we have no chance for wobble. You're looking at nothing but a Cadillac as far as smooth is concerned on cutting a wooden bat. It's greater than none. You see no wobble on the platform. I mean, we've got a straight billet that's been inspected the right way. And again, the pop that comes off of these maple and ash bats is it's unbeatable at times. have what we call a baseball bat. As you see it looks a little funny and if Norm was over here I'd ask him to fill it and he could also verify that it's a little bit rough right now. The texture of a wooden baseball bat needs to be ultra smooth in order to fit the player's hands and not tear up his batting gloves every time. So the next step we're going to take with the bat making process is head down here to the sander and let's see if we can make the texture from rough to smooth for our player. 
second step here ensures that our bat, our hands of our players don't get all gritted up. We want a nice smooth texture here at the end of the bat making process. As you can see, you've got 1500 RPM versus the 2500 we saw earlier. It's a little bit slower. However, it still gets the job done because we're actually taking off a small, small portion of that diameter of the bat. If we go too big, we get a lot of complaints. So we just want to take off a little bit, but also make it super smooth at the same time. This is a six-stage sander. You can do six bats at a time. Here we're just going through with two. bats release out of the sander here you're going to notice that we still have a almost a bat here but it looks a little bit goofy how many of you guys would take this up to home plate not too many probably because you don't see too many other major leagues having them but as you can see i also left my space self plenty of room for my barrel so i have no damage to my barrel right in here and also no damage to my knob throughout the sanding process let's go see how we transform the billet into a bat right over here in these next two stages make two chops here. As you can see, I want to find a way to take off the little knob piece. What I'm going to make a chop here. And believe it or not, we do some math here at DBAT as well. And history, math, and science is all around us. And now I've got my length ready to go. I'm going to go with 33 inch bat. That's what Norm likes to swing. And I bet that lefty can drive out of the park with this 33 inch. Let's see what happens. Here. Now then, do we have a baseball bat? Some kids would readily agree that we do. However, most baseball players say it look a little bit funny right now. Well, here at DBAT, we, we use the scientific method quite a bit. What we're aiming for in business is efficiency. That's coming out with the same end result, but doing it in a quick manner. Now, if I rush through it and do it real hastily, then that's not the way to do it here at DBAT. But we're looking for efficiency. The first method we try here, all you young kids that have been here at the tour, you've tried this method with me. We get a piece of sandpaper. I immediately ask for a rocking chair because I know it's going to take me 30 days to get one bat done. Is that being efficient here at DBAT? Bat, my bosses would alleviate me. I'd have no longer have a job if that's what I consider efficient. So let's go over here and look at this wheel that's going to be my guide and we're going to actually transform the bat in a matter of three seconds time versus the 30 days. So let's look. All right, this time I put the sandpaper down. I'm going to try this new method here and anytime you're in science and your method doesn't work, guess what? You get to try right back over from the start. That's kind of how life is to a degree, but you get a brand new day every day. And that's what we like about using science around here. Now this is going to be my guide, and I'm going to put the uh, barrel of the bat right up against that guide. I'm going to turn it in three seconds time. You're going to see the billet transform into the bat right here. That quick, we have us a baseball bat. Now then what you've seen is come down off of two machines and it finally touches hands to get to where the links are and to get this spot as well. So this is where our hand work comes in. Again, I'm going to use this as my guide and the router bit here is going to be helpful and the fact it's going to help me cut it down a lot quicker. And again, we have the same baseball bat. That's being efficient here at DBAT Incorporated. And that's what you're looking for in all businesses. Doing something in a quick manner, but coming out with the same end result. That's the key. Here I've got where I've got a line and my customer, anytime you have a customer wanting a, biz, a, a, a finished product, you gotta have it looking nice. So my paint's not gonna go off there nice and evenly. So I have to flap it here. As you can see, we have a nice smooth tip now and the, the paint will go off there nice and evenly. Um, the thing you're looking for though, we have what you call e-commerce that's setting up a website where customers go to your website and buy something online. The first 30 days we had our, our product set up on there, we had $32,000 in sales. So if you guys got a product or an idea, it takes about $6 a month to host, but you can get one made for $300 and then you can start making money with your idea. But if you have an idea, I really, 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 really want to stress the fact that you need to get it out there on the e-commerce. That's, that's the best place to put your ideas. Okay, I have what we call a rough edge here. All you teachers out there will a uh, sticker stick to a rough surface. 
not at all. It needs to be nice and smooth. So in order to get our end, end knob stickers to put on there, we have to make it nice and smooth. So let me show you this next step. This is what you call a belt sander. As you can see, it's nice and smooth now. I put any sticker or any markings I need to put on there, and it's not it's gonna be legible. Alright, the final thing we're gonna do here at D-Bat, I know I got a 33 inch out, 33 inch bat, and most of them need to weigh at least negative three. So if I got a 33 inch bat, it needs to be weighing 30, uh, 30 ounces whenever it comes out of the paint room is the key. So before I go into the paint room, I have to make sure that I know whether it's a half dip or a full dip of paint. So we got to use our math knowledge here. So math, science, and history are all around us, and we're going to go ahead and apply our math, math skills right here. So follow me to the scales here. We're going to start off on zero here. And again, we're looking for 29.5. This is going to be a half dip of paint. So whenever I go into the paint room, which is the next room, Norm can testify how, how hot it is back here. That's what we teach young kids. If you get to the library two to three hours a week, it prevents you from having to work eight to 12 hours a day in this kind of environment. So what we want to look for here is how can I get 0.4 off of there in order to add a half dip of paint so whenever it comes out, that 33 inch bat is going to be exactly 30 ounces. Well, let's see. The good old Pro Cup me to dictate weights just a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and put a small cup in here, nothing deep at all, because we're only taking 0.4 out. That come down. And you always want to be a little bit heavier, if anything, because you can always take a, a little bit away. So I'm going to take one more fraction off of there. It's hard to put it back on there. It comes to a solid piece of wood. So now then with the Pro Cup, you see, it's going to allow me to go down to 29, well, sorry about that, it'll be about 29.5 here. And again, now we're ready to paint this bat. This can go into the paint room, and the paint room again is a lot of labor. I cannot stress the importance of going to the library your, your freshman and sophomore years for one hour to the junior college libraries, guys. You're going to not feel that it's nice and cold in the uh, summertime and very, very hot in the wintertime, but that place has got all the books you need in order to, to be successful in life. But let's go look at this paint room where you really don't want to spend most of your time working. So let's go see what happens in there. All right, this is going to be the paint process. Uh, the first step is to, to remove any extra dust on the bat. That way the customer has no extra clumps on there. He wants to be able to run his hands down there nice and smooth like it is right now. And this this system here is what we call the dip down system. It's uh, definitely effective but it takes a little bit longer than what you would get out of a spray line. A spray line would have them going all over the factory here. We're just letting them sit in one spot and most of that paint is running back into our, our paint booth here. Um, that way we're not that way we're not uh, wasting as much. And what you're gonna see is it going to uh, drip? It's a drip down system. It allows uh, at least 15, 20 minutes to get it to where it drips down solid enough and then come back and tap it. As you can see, it's dripping now and we want to come back and tap it so we get a nice, clean, smooth end on it. Um, these two bats here, they're going to go to some customers there in D-Bat Mansfield. It looks like they're going to use it for some cage bats. But we love our customers around here. And uh, if you guys need a bat and need to put your name on it, you know where to come. D-Bat Incorporated is here to serve you guys. Here's one of our pro player bats. You can see we got our dot already on there. We, we're going to pull that off and measure our slope of the grain. But he's just going to put another logo on here. And all pro player bats, that's what you young kids want to strive to be. But anybody that gets their names on their bats are normally the pro players or pros to become. We love the young kids to try their best and do their hardest at everything that they do. But if they got a name on their bat, that's one thing I tell the young kids not to do is to share the bat. Because anytime you got your name on a tool, that's your tool. As you can see, we're going to go through and go and put it through the top coat. This allows our logos to stick on there a little bit crisper and cleaner. Then after the top coat, we're going to go in and laser the name. So that's why we leave them on there right now. But if it doesn't have a laser name, we go ahead and put the in barrel information on there. As you can see, the in barrel goes on just right here, and that's where the player's name would be as well. But that's strictly in barrel. Coherent 
light we're about to look at travels so fast that we're not going to be able to recognize with our eyes, but however, it's very, very resourceful in the field of science. A coherent light is also known as a laser light. Let's go in here and look at a laser light. As we go in here, Norm, you tell them how cool it is and what, what a library condition feels like after being in the factory. Come on in. Here's the coherent light I was talking about a little bit earlier. This is the light that travels in a straight line without ever spreading. As you can see, our laser tube is generating the light. It's coming down, hitting this mirror, traveling in a straight line with its coherent state and hitting our object, or this mirror down here, which in turn hits our object. As you can see, we're, we're creating a little message here on the end of the bat. And this is going to be where most of the pro players get, get their information done with their bats here. But the laser light, as you can see, you can't see the light itself, but you can see the power what's behind it there. And that's a lot like what the term grace. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. But let's look at the power here. I'm going to actually let it go through and, and print this first, this next message, and then we're going to stop it in between. And then we're going to discover why we can't truly see that light, but we see the end result. I would like to see that light if possible, and we'll see if that's possible. We'll see if that's imaginable here in science. Can you guys begin to read what that says? I think it says the out of the norm show. Y'all see that? Nice and clear. It says reflective imaging we're doing with mirrors, so it's kind of backwards. Now then, I've got the laser stopped here. Sophisticated dot matrix, it just prints down to the exact point that we have on our computer system over there and travels through a USB cord and then comes out and gets our end result here. As you can see, it says Norm Allen. And let me pull it out and then we're gonna reprint a logo on there. But let's read the finished product here. Norm Allen, the out of the norm show where the stories are all about you right on a bat. Now if you want your company name or logo on a bat, you give Lance a call over there at DBAT. He'll be more than happy to take care of you. I do appreciate Norm coming out and seeing the factory today. And one thing we did for him, I don't know, he saw a little bit of the laser going on, but we created him his own bat here. How cool is this? A home run hitter. <laughs> well this is great, brother. I, I really appreciate you guys and, and your hospitality. And the best part is I appreciate what the, what the work they're doing is not only is, is part of something in a, a sport that's forever in America, but you're creating something that's also educational, because we learned a lot today. Yes, sir. We try to, try to, what the Lord's taught us, we also like to share. You know, we don't keep it all a secret. You said earlier, you said you think with your mind and you work with your heart. Yes, sir. That way, you know, we, we learn with our mind. We put anything and everything in our minds, and if it transcends into the heart work, guess what? No one can beat you, because when you're working with your heart, he that's in your heart is greater than he that's in the world. So we truly believe that we have the best product here. And not too many people know about us, but Norm, you coming out oh. and speaking volumes about us, I know that a lot more people are going to be aware of the DBAT brand. Well, I hope so. Now, you're open here in Mount Pleasant for factory tours all year round? or? Yes, sir. Monday through Friday normally. If you call ahead, there's a little bit of a fee if you want a Saturday for your, one of your team gatherings or something, but we can also open up on Saturdays on occasions, but okay. that does require a fee. But we'll, I, we'll put your address and phone number and email address, well, not email, but your, your website. Yes, sir. We'll put that on the screen so you can uh, take advantage of that. If, especially, you know, this would be great corporate gifts just to have bats made for your team out there. And once you get to Mena, Arkansas, I know you're up above there, but once you get there, you're pretty much here. So if you can drive down to Mena, guys, just come on a little come further, yeah. and you'll see a small, small piece of the baseball heavens. I tell people we're a microscopic piece. And I told Norm earlier, we got to get our microscopes out and look about 10,000 power. <laughs> but once you find us, you find that we are a small piece of that baseball heavens that looks over all the baseball diamonds. Preserving the greatness of America. You know, and, and I thank Lance and everybody here at DBAT. You know, one of the things that I want to always say, I always try to tell you something that hopefully will stick with you. The stories are important because we're getting an education, we're getting some entertainment, and uh, we're having some fun, and I'm getting some great collection of neat stuff from around the country. But the most important part is that you're getting a piece of America that's still great. Yeah. People who are in business, who are creative, and have the spirit of just move forward regardless of what's on the outside. When you walk in this door, there is no daily news. There's only a mission, and the mission is beautiful, and it always hits home runs. We hope you'll join us again on the Out of the Norm show for another one, because we could be in your backyard, in your hometown, 
the story could be, as always, on the Out of the Norm show, all about you. I'll see you again soon. I'm going to go out and take a few swings here. We'll see you again soon. Just loving you.